When St. John Bosco went to Rome in 1876, a Salesian priest wrote, The war against our congregation still rages fiercely, but with God's help and the Pope's support, we shall win. Who were they at war with? Who fought against their congregation? It wasn't the heretic Waldensians or the Masons on this occasion. No, this time the attacks came from inside the church, from Don Bosco's own Archbishop of Turin, Gastaldi. We'll hear how to respectfully navigate this very painful sort of persecution even when the media picks up the story and openly lies about it. This video will also cover a supernatural dream sent to Don Bosco in the midst of this terrible situation, which involved a raging hyena and a kind shepherd. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. In Holy Week of 1876, Don Bosco went to Rome to speak with Pope Pius IX about his order of Salesians. Someone once remarked that Pius IX always seemed to receive him readily. I really do my best not to waste time, Don Bosco explained. One has to know what he wants. Some people spin long yarns and keep repeating themselves until the Pope interrupts, in short, what do you want? I always have a lot of things to ask, but I draw them up into a very concise list. Once I'm ushered in, I express myself briefly. The Pope laughingly remarks, You are very brief in order not to tire me, but I am even briefer. Pius IX couldn't have received him more benevolently. Later, Don Bosco told his Salesians, It's amazing! No obstacles or difficulties block our path in Rome. The Lord really wishes to embarrass us with his bounty. I repeat, it's truly amazing. While speaking to the Pope about our missionary work in Patagonia, I told him that we could plan a chain of schools for native boys along our side of the border, almost separating it from the rest of the continent. When these boys would become priests, we could send them back to convert their parents, brothers, and friends. I told him that several boys have already been admitted to our school at San Nicolas and that some give evidence of a priestly vocation. The Holy Father was most delighted to hear this news and, lifting his hand to heaven, exclaimed, Glory to God! Patagonians will convert their own country, thus eliminating the need of sending missionaries into countries whose language, culture, and customs are utterly alien to them. I believe that once native priests are at hand, the conversion of Patagonia will be assured. Unfortunately, the troubles at his oratory school in Turin dogged Don Bosco's steps even to Rome. It was a mystery, but the Archbishop of Turin, Gastaldi, was very hostile to Don Bosco and his Salesians. Father Berto wrote of the situation, The Archbishop of Turin has laden me with work. We build, and he tries to demolish. Here in Rome, we may say that the hostility of Turin's archbishop is known to all the sacred congregations. In fact, the officials are kind enough to warn Don Bosco to be on guard and alert to ward off attacks. Pius IX's support for Don Bosco wasn't imagined by our saint. In private audiences, the Pope would speak at length about the Salesian congregation and the deplorable friction with Archbishop Gastaldi. Instead of being helpful to the Salesians, the Archbishop constantly talked of reviving the Order of Rosminians, or also known as the Institute of Charity. But whenever he would bring them up, the Pope would reply, Yes, the Rosminians do a lot of good, but believe me, my friend, they are not as attached to the Holy See as Don Bosco and his priests. To crown it all, Don Bosco's seminarians were temporarily refused ordination because of some technicalities dreamed up by the archbishop. We can easily imagine how hurt Don Bosco felt because of these refusals. He told his Salesians, How many, despite their will to work for God's glory, are diverted from their goal? Malicious gossip and calumny render their work fruitless and at times force them to abandon it or even flee from their field of apostolate. The same can be said of many religious orders. Still, we keep growing and are in demand everywhere. In April, Don Bosco narrated two warning dreams to his secretary, who, as usual, wrote them down. What they hint at is fairly obvious. 
During the night of April 7th, Father Berto heard Don Bosco cry out in his sleep, Anthony, Anthony. The next morning, he asked him how he had slept and mentioned having heard him cry out. Don Bosco then told him the dream. I seemed to be standing near the bottom of a stairway in a very narrow place. Suddenly, a hyena barred my way. In that predicament, I called to Anthony for help, though he had died many years before. Meanwhile, the hyena moved toward me. Not knowing what else to do, I thrust my hand down its throat. I was terrified, and no one was coming to my rescue. At last, a shepherd came down from the hills and said, Help must come from above, but to obtain it, one needs to descend very low. The lower one goes, the greater will the help be. That beast doesn't harm anyone who ignores it. Then I woke up. He dreamed again another night and narrated it as follows. I seemed to be in my native town and saw the Pope arrive. I couldn't believe my eyes and asked, Holy Father, where's your coach? Never mind, my coach is fidelity, fortitude, and meekness, he said. He was completely exhausted and kept saying, I am at the end. No, no, Holy Father, I replied. You will not die until the problems of our congregation have been solved. Suddenly, a carriage materialized out of nowhere. It had no horses. Then, mysteriously, a dog, a goat, and a sheep appeared and hitched themselves to it. At a certain point, however, they were unable to pull it any further. The Pope was weakening ever more. I regretted that I had not invited him into my house to eat some food and kept saying to myself, I'll do so as soon as we reach the chaplain's house at Morialdo. But meantime, the coach was at a standstill. So I pulled up a plank which touched the ground at the back of the coach. The Pope saw me and exclaimed, if the people of Rome ever saw you doing this kind of work, they would have a good laugh. As I kept tugging at it, I woke up. Don Bosco gave no further explanation of this dream. Meanwhile, capitalizing on this clerical conflict, the newspaper La Lanterna del Ficanasso, the busybody's searchlight, attacked Don Bosco in two articles, lying about everything. The first of these was entitled Don Bosco in Rome. They said that he had just been suspended from all priestly functions and had gone to Rome for this reason, which absolutely wasn't true. The newspaper maintained that Archbishop Castaldi had suspended him from the celebration of Mass because he had too many connections in Rome and exploited this advantage to bypass the Archbishop's authority. It ended, We shall see who is the more powerful, Don Bosco or Archbishop Castaldi. This is what anti-Catholic fake news journalists always do. They pit church clerics against one another. Well, Don Bosco wasn't playing their game. He would never publicly attack any other member of the clergy. In fact, they published another article in their newspaper, which the Salesians confirmed, for the most part, was true. Three gentlemen called at the St. Francis de Sales print shop to have a manuscript published. This print shop was run by Don Bosco, and he agreed to print it, set the price, and accepted the manuscript. Three days later, the customers came by to see how things were going. Gentlemen, Don Bosco said, I ask a thousand pardons. Kill me if you wish, but God inspired me to burn it, and so I did. Why, they asked him, because this manuscript didn't speak too well of our dearly beloved archbishop. It was a manuscript of at least a thousand pages which concocted such a biography of the archbishop that the book would have offered indisputable grounds for a libel suit. I think it's amazing that Don Bosco defended a man who attacked him at every turn. Fortunately, there were four other newspapers that came out and defended St. John Bosco and his oratory, which was an easy task because his virtue and many miracles were well known all throughout Europe. If you'd like to see St. John Bosco's 200 Days March Prophecy, just click on the link above me here. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.